Good evening and welcome to the Wednesday evening Bible study at Bridgeway Baptist Church. I am so excited that you and I are here one more time together to study God's Word, and I am looking forward to all that God has for us this evening. So before we get into the Bible study, let's bow our heads and we'll pray. Heavenly Father, once again, we are so grateful for your Word. We're grateful, Lord, that you've promised that your Holy Spirit would come and meet with us when we're gathered in your name. And so, Lord, we are clinging to that promise tonight that you would come, Holy Spirit, meet with us, be our teacher tonight, open our eyes to the words of the Lord and speak to us. Lord, we pray for our pastor and his wife, and we thank you for them. Lord, we love them, and we thank you for the ministry that they have here, and pray that you would continue to bless them, that you would give them wisdom and understanding, that you would give them mercy and grace and strength for those things which you have given them to do here in this place. Be with pastor as he leads the church, Lord. Give him great discernment and wisdom. Now, Lord, once again, we thank you for this time. Open our eyes that we might behold wondrous things out of thy law. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, tonight we are going to continue our study in Proverbs chapter 17 with verses 7 through 17. And again, the title of the message is, Even a Fool is Counted Wise. Remember our key verse? Let's say that together. Proverbs 17, 28. Even a fool, when he holdeth his peace, is counted wise, and he that shutteth his lips is esteemed a man of understanding. Now, we're going to go ahead and skip past that few things about the chapter. They're there in your notes, and you can look them over, but we're going to go right into the study tonight. And as we continue with our study of Proverbs in verses 7 through 17, we're going to begin these verses with the speech of a fool, but we're going to end with the love of a friend. And Solomon, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, sheds more light on who the foolish, wicked, evil person is, what they're headed for, and how the wise person should respond to them. So let's look into verse number seven. It says, Excellent speech becometh not a fool, much less do lying lips a prince. Now, this verse seems very straightforward, before we look at it, though, let's review the words excellent, becometh, and prince. So the word excellent literally means this. It means an overhanging, an excess, remainder, what they leave that hath left, plentiful, remnant. It means to uh, cause to abound, to be left behind, make plenteous. Then And residue, by the way, I want to put that one in there. By the way, also becometh means suitable, beautiful, comely, at home. It also could mean satisfaction. It means the God's temple, residence. It also means a habitation or a stable. And then finally, the word prince means this, voluntary generous, magnanimous. It also could mean a grandee, which is sometimes a tyrant. It means liberal things, noble, prince, willing, willing-hearted, to volunteer as a soldier, to offer freely or offer yourself willingly. And so excellent and becometh combined make a harsh but truthful commentary about the words of a foolish person. Simply put, they're not memorable. It's not who the fool is. And it's also evident that this verse is a contrast between the fool and the prince. However, there is more to it than that. So let's look again at the definition of the word prince. You see words like voluntary and generous, magnanimous, willing-hearted, offer freely, offer self-willingly. Although it does mean an actual prince, when this same word is interpreted in other parts of the Old Testament, it is always associated with a willingness to give to the Lord. And it's that much even as it is a sign of nobility. So, with that in mind, let's look at the verse again. Excellent speech becometh not a fool, much less do lying lips a prince. As much as we know that a person who has a willing given spirit will not lie, 
we also know that a fool will not say anything that is worth remembering. Why? Because it's not who they are. The wise person is the one that's willing and giving spirit. But the fool, unfortunately, because they don't care about wisdom and they don't, they don't want to look to the Lord, the things that they say are just gone. They're not remembered. Now let's look at verse number eight. A gift is as a precious stone in the eyes of him that hath it. Whithersoever it turneth, it prospereth. Now, to understand this particular verse, we really need to look at the definition of the word gift. So let's look at that now. It's there in your notes. It means a donation, bribe, bribery, gift, present, reward, to donate, bribe, or give a reward. In the Old Testament, in fact, this word gift almost always refers to bribes. And verse 8 relays the truth that a bribe gives the receiver, that person that is getting the bribe, a false sense of power and prosperity. However, the wise person doesn't desire this kind of gift. Let's look at what the Apostle Paul said about it in Philippians 4.17. Not that I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. The Apostle Paul had been blessed by several churches, and he was expressing both his gratitude and his need. However, in verse 17, he reveals what his real desire was, and that was not for himself, but for the spiritual well-being of the church. He wanted those Christians to be fruitful, and that's the wise person. The wise person never seeks their own. They only desire what God can give. Now let's look at verse number 9. Verse number 9 says, He that covereth a transgression seeketh love, but he that repeateth a matter separateth very friends. Now the first part of this verse gives a wonderful picture of a true friend. But you know what? I think we've seen this principle before. Let's look back at Proverbs 11.3. Here's what it says. But he that is of a faithful spirit concealeth a matter. That's it. A true friend has a faithful spirit. They also cherish the friendship, the relationship, and so they know when something needs to be kept private. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's anything bad. It just doesn't need to be told. But there is more to this verse, and Solomon shows us the other side of the picture, which also looks very familiar. Let's look at the word friends in the second part of verse number nine. Here's what it means. Familiar, a friend, gentle, a bullock as being tame, a chieftain like a neat cattle. It also means to associate with, to teach, learn, utter. Haven't we seen this definition before? Let's look at back at chapter 16 of verse number 28. A froward man soweth strife, and a whisperer separateth chief friends. That's right. It looks back to the words of the previous chapter, chapter 16, chief friends in verse 28, and then spells out plainly who this whisperer is. They don't care about friendship or the damage that they do. They only want to cause trouble, whether it's for a moment or for a lifetime. Then let's look at verse number 10. Verse number 10 says this, A reproof entereth more into a wise man than a hundred stripes into a fool. Here we have another testimony of the wise. They listen to verbal correction, not the fool. In fact, the word entereth really reveals to what degree the wise receive correction. Look at what it says. It means to sink descend, to press or lead down, be broken, cause to come down, enter, go down, press sore, settle, stick fast. Be broken, stick fast, press sore. This is the testimony of the wise person. They not only listen, they are broken because of their sin. The words of correction stick with them, and they don't forget because they press sorely upon them. 
We've seen this before, however. Verse 10 brings the picture of the wise person into focus even more. But let's look back at Proverbs 1, 5 and 9, 9. It says, a wise man will hear and will increase learning. And a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels in Proverbs 1, 5. Then in Proverbs 9, 9, it says, give instruction to a wise man and he will be yet wiser. Teach a just man and he will increase in learning. So how does the wise person do what Proverbs 1, 5 and 9, 9 say? They do it by letting reproof enter them. You know, but unfortunately, this is not the story of the fool. The fool is so stubborn that they will not change their way, even if they're given the most severe punishment imaginable. Can you imagine this? Even in Bible times, when, when Jesus was on the earth, the Romans gave 39 stripes. Now, that was given with a whip that was just unimaginable. But the Bible is saying that a fool will take even a hundred stripes and it won't even phase them. I don't know about you, but I don't want that to be said about me. I would much rather be the wise person that when I'm approached and someone has seen something or they've heard or whatever the case may be, and they need to speak to me about something that is in my life, that the Lord is working in me enough to, to where I say, you know what? Thank you. And I'm broken over what they say, and I, I want to be more like the Lord Jesus. Now let's look at verse number 11. An evil man seeketh only rebellion. Therefore a cruel messenger shall be sent against him. Now this is a really significant verse, and it begins a story that actually concludes in verse 16. Once again, it shows us the attitude of the wicked, evil, foolish person but this time we see how serious the situation really is. Before we jump into it, though, let's look at the word rebellion. The word rebellion means bitterness, rebellion, bitter or rebellious, most rebellious. It means to be or make bitter unpleasant, to rebel, resist, provoke, be disobedient, provocation, provoking. First, as we see here in verse 11, the wicked, evil, foolish person has a rebel heart that is full of bitterness and disobedience. However, if we really want to look at the whole verse, we have to understand the depth of this rebellion, and we're going to have to look back at one of the earlier words, the word seeketh. So let's look at the definition of seeketh. It means to search out in worship or prayer to strive after, ask, beg, beseech, desire, inquire, inquisition, procure, request, require. Wow. To search out in worship or prayer, strive after, beg, procure, this means that the wicked, evil, foolish person, they're on a quest, and they only have one goal in mind, and they will do anything that they can to obtain it. So when you add this kind of dedication to a rebellious, bitter, disobedient heart, you get someone who is allowing all those attitudes to control them. And because they allow them to control them, no matter where they go or who they're with or what they do, the outcome is always going to be the same. They will face trouble at every turn. Let's look at what the New Testament says about this. It says, their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips. Whoso, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness, their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And that's Romans 3, 13-18. We are all capable of this happening to us. And that's why the writer of Hebrews wrote this. Follow peace with all men 
and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Here's what we need to realize. We are still flesh. We still must take care to know the Lord, which includes being peaceable and being holy, being as holy as we can. Obviously, holy is perfection, but we, we want to strive toward holiness so that we do not allow bitterness to sprout up. Notice that the Bible uses the word looking in those verses we just looked at in the New Testament. Not only are we to stay right with the Lord, we are to allow others to look at our lives and warn us when they see things that we may not see, which is exactly what the wise man does in Proverbs chapter 17. Now let's look at verse number 12. Let a bear robbed of her whelps meet a man rather than a fool in his folly. Now here in verse number 12, we find the first warning of four warnings that we're going to see in these next few verses. And the rebel of verse number 11 is a fool. Trouble is going to follow them. And by the way, it would be better to have your body torn apart by an angry mama bear than to even meet. And that word meet means whether it's by accident or you are forcibly taken, whether to even meet a fool when they're being foolish. And sadly, the story and the warning does not stop there. Let's keep reading by looking at verse number 13. Whoso rewardeth evil for good, evil shall not depart from his house. So we saw the first warning, and that's to stay away from a fool, not even go across their path when they're in their folly. This is the second warning, and it continues with the scope of the person's rebellion and trouble. Remember in verse 11, we found that no matter where they turn, all they see is evil, and it gets worse. Verse 13 tells us that evil shall not depart from their house because they are on this quest of bitterness and rebellion, and all they do is evil, even if someone is good to them. The scripture now says that their children will also reap what has been sown. You know, unfortunately, I believe that all of us have probably met families like this. They're always under a cloud of bitterness. They don't recognize when anybody attempts to help them or do good to them. And unfortunately, the bitterness goes on and on for generations. Oh, may God help you and I to not be one of those families, not be one of those people, but to be wise. But once again, it doesn't stop there. We need to look on to verse number 14. It says, The beginning of strife is as when one letteth out water. Therefore, leave off contention before it be meddled with. So verse 14 brings the picture into focus, literally. Uh, it reveals the third warning by giving a word picture of how all of this happens. How does bitterness begin? The word strife reveals that it's a fight or a quarrel. Then comes the word picture, as when one letteth out water. The words, when one letteth out, actually represent one Hebrew word. And let's look at that now. Let's see the definition of those words together, when one letteth out. It's the Hebrew word, potar, and it means to cleave or burst through, to emit, gape, dismiss, free, let shoot out, slip away. So here's the thought. A fight can begin to break a person, just like an earthquake may cause a small crack in a dam or a levee. There may not be anything visible when it happens, but a small crack or hole will get bigger, and by the time it becomes visible, it's nearly impossible to stop. The water bursts through, destroying everything in its path. So Solomon gives us wise advice. Don't even let it start. Now, I know that that sounds like the end of the matter, but when we read the last part of verse 14, we find the words, be meddled with. Now, what does that mean? 
Now, I thought I knew what it meant, and, and you may think, well, I think I've got it. Well, let's take a look at it and see what it means. To be meddled with, again, is one Hebrew word, gala, and it means to be obstinate, inner meddle. Obstinate? I wasn't expecting that, and I, I guess, you know, since how we have seen the word obstinate, we better get the meaning of obstinate as well. So it means stubborn, adhering to an opinion or purpose, fixed firmly in resolution, not yielding to reason, arguments, or any other means, not easily subdued or removed. So once more we see the rebel in verse 11. God in his wisdom shows us this is more than just stopping. He wants you and I to understand that only a rebellious, wicked, evil, foolish person will fight and quarrel. Man, that list keeps getting longer, doesn't it? Now they're a rebellious, wicked, evil, foolish person. And it's going to get longer as we go throughout the book of Proverbs. And there, there's attitudes in those folks that we cannot see that arise in the heart of someone when there's a fight or quarrel. And it remains there long after that fight is over. The only way to keep the water behind the dam of the person, their heart, is to never cause it to crack. Don't get in a quarrel that causes people to hold on to things and become bitter in their heart. And, and you and I, if we have a quarrel, don't be the person that says, I'm hanging on to this. No, that's not what the wise person does. That's what the foolish person does. But wait. Unfortunately, the saga continues, and we need to look on to verse number 15. He that justifieth the wicked, and he that condemneth the just, even they are both an abomination to the Lord. This verse is almost like a God-sent FYI, Let's look at the words, he that justifieth. Once again, there are three words that make one word, and I can't pronounce it, unfortunately, but it means this. To be or make right, to cleanse, clear self, justify self, be righteous, turn to righteousness. And verse 4, 15, excuse me, is the fourth warning since verse 12. The warning is to those who would stand on the side of the rebel. And the key word, actually, to that verse is the word abomination to the Lord. You see, when anyone stands with a rebel and says, they aren't wrong, in fact, this is the righteous person, that person is standing against God himself. The rebel, no matter what human they have wronged is rebelling against God, and that includes anyone who stands with them. You know, there's a great example of this in the book of Numbers, chapter 16, and we're going to look at that. So go ahead and look in your notes there. I've included, I've cut it down just a little bit so it's not as long, but let's look at what it says. It says, Now Korah and Dathan and Abiram and On took men. And they rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown, and they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said unto them, Ye take much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, even every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation. Now look what it says. And when Moses heard it, he fell upon his face. Those men stood up against Moses, but immediately Moses understood who they were really standing against. And he proves that if we look on further in verse number 5 and 11. And he spake unto Korah, Tomorrow the Lord will show who are his and who is holy, and will cause him to come near unto him, even him who he hath chosen, for which cause both thou and all thy company are gathered together against the Lord. Now, we're going to fast forward to the end of the story, 
And actually the story ends in Proverbs 17, verse 11 and 15. You say that's impossible. Well, we're going to see it right here. Verse 11 says, An evil man seeketh only rebellion. Therefore a cruel messenger shall be sent against him. He that justifieth the wicked and he that condemneth the just, even they both are abomination to the Lord. Now, unfortunately, that's the ending of that story. And it is the ending for every person that stands in rebellion against our God. Now, I want to encourage you, we're not doing that right now, but go back and read the rest of the story of Dathan and Abiram and On and see what actually happened to those that rebelled against God. But I want to warn you, it is a sad, sad tale, not only for them, but also for their families, their children. And that's what God has warned. And now, verse number 16, we have the final warning. Wherefore is there a price in the hand of a fool to get wisdom, seeing he hath no heart for it? You know, in verse number 16, we have this warning, and it really represents what's on the headstone and in the obituary of the life of a foolish, rebellious person. Here's what it says. They did not want true wisdom. No matter how much or how little it costs, a fool wants no part of wisdom. They don't desire it. It's not even in their heart. Why? Because of where it comes from. True wisdom comes from God, and they don't want that. And we saw that in Proverbs 14. A scorner seeketh wisdom and findeth it not. Also, we saw it again in Proverbs 15, 12. The scorner loveth not one that reproveth him, neither will he go unto the wise. And you may say, well, Bill, that said the scorner. We understand as we've studied throughout the book of Proverbs that the word scorner, the word froward, the, the, the word uh, um, unjust and, and wicked, all of those are interchangeable for the word fool. Why is that? Because this person that's scorning, they're scorning the Lord, and against God's people, and they have no desire to be wise. So here's the moral of the story. Stay away from the fool. Don't be a fool. But we get to end with some good news. How about that? Let's look at verse 17. A friend loveth at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Now, before we really get into the good news, we need to look at one word in this verse, and that's the word friend. Let's see what it says. An associate, brother, companion, fellow, husband, another, to tend a flock or pasture it, to graze, to associate with as a friend, companion, uh, make friendship, pastor, shepherd. Do you see it? Do you recognize this friend that loves at all times? Let's look at the definition again. There's words like brother, husband, another, to tend a flock or pasture it, shepherd. Now here, I'm, I'm going to help you out. Look in your notes. You have a passage of scripture right there. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It also says in Proverbs 18, 24, A man that hath friends must show himself friendly, and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Just as we saw that the rebel is really fighting against God, it is Jesus who is our friend, our brother, our companion, our shepherd, 
Only God can give us true wisdom. And only God can keep you and I from the fate of the fool and be that friend that is there in hard times. That word there in, in the verse that says, and a brother is born for adversity, that word adversary, uh, uh, adversity literally means a tight spot, a place where you're squeezed. Oh, isn't that how Jesus is? When you and I get to a place where we don't know what to do, where to go, he is right there for us. He is our friend. And folks, you and I don't have to be the fool or the rebel. We just need to follow the Lord and look to him and allow him to guide us into true wisdom. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you once again for your word and for this time that we have had together. Oh, God, may we keep our eyes on you. May we look to our friend for help. For Lord, we know that you are there. You have said, cast all your care upon me as I care for you. Thank you, Lord. We love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I hope that you've enjoyed the lesson tonight. Have a wonderful evening. God bless you. And Lord willing, we'll see you on Sunday. Good night.